and then they let the airport authority generate the revenue, run the airport, manage the airport, and they're completely responsible for the airport. That took a lot of the politics out of it, and it really made it, um, it I think in Laurel's case, it made this project work. This, this, is the, this project actually did have to go to condemnation. And that's not a good thing. Um, weren't able to work things out in a favorable manner with the property owners before it went to court. But it did, it did take the city out of that process, which was, which was probably a, a benefit to the airport project being done. Um, while it did go to condemnation, it did have to follow the federal uniform relocation and land acquisition policy. And there is a, and that process is basically established to, to protect the property owners, to make sure that appraisals are done, to make sure that the properties are fairly and justly appraised, and to make sure that purchase and need is there and just compensation is being done. Um, I'm going to take Laurel as, a, as another example of the economic airports, economic impacts that an airport can have on a community. And uh, I think the next speaker, Grant, is going to talk about um, the economic study that has been done for the Colville community and their airport. But I'm not going to try to steal too much of your thunder, but I am going to talk about the study that was done um, specifically for the Laurel Airport. And a couple of years ago, our aeronautics division, Montana Aeronautics Division, um, did a statewide economic study of the value of airports. And um, they took all, we have about 120 um, um, public use airports in the state, we have about 130, so there's a comparable number. And But they looked at each airport on a case-by-case -case basis, and these are the results for Laurel. Um, we have three types of costs. We have direct costs, we have indirect costs, and we have induced costs that are, are impacts, that, economic impacts that airports have. And the direct costs are basically um, because the airport is there, this is these are the direct costs as a direct result of the airport being there. Things like flight instruction, uh, air and charter service, um, ground transportation, hangar rentals. Those those that revenue that's generated just because the airport's there. On Laurel, there's 24 on airport jobs, and it has a total economic output of about 2.4 million dollars. Um, the next set of economic impacts at Laurel are what we call indirect impacts. And when an aircraft arrives on Laurel, they might have business to do in Laurel. They might eat at the restaurant, stay in a hotel in Laurel or whatever, and what we call those indirect impacts. Um, but those are, those are, those are um, impacts or revenue that's brought into the community because people use the airport. People come to Laurel and use the airport. Um, the study indicated that the Laurel Airport creates about 22 indirect jobs um, because the airport is though that takes care of hotels and restaurants and things like that and results in another 1.1 million dollars. And then we have um, induced economic impacts. And how many times those dollars roll over in the community um, and support you know, other businesses within the community. Those are induced impacts. And that results in another 35 jobs, or about another 900,000 in, in economic output. And when you total those direct, indirect, and induced economic impacts, what the study indicated for this, the Laurel Airport, was that it, it contributes about 82 jobs in our community, about $2.1 million in revenue and in direct wages, and about um, nearly $6 million in economic output. So I, I point to Laurel because I think the community is similar in nature to Colvin. 
and Laurel is about 7,000 people. Um, it is about 15 miles south, or about 15 miles west of Billings. So um, I think the community is somewhat similar in nature, at least as far as um, the size of the city of Laurel. Um, your region, from what I get out of the last study, is that um, this airport could essentially serve a community of about 31,000 people in the surrounding area in Stevens County in Colorado. So, um, just going to briefly go through maybe some of the constraints that your airport has um, and which prevent it from becoming a regional airport. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that a new airport has to be built, but these are some of the limiting factors in creating an elite regional airport at, at the existing site. Basically, um, the runway protection zones are you know, maybe a little bit hard to see, but you can see some shaded trapezoidal areas off the ends of the runway. And basically, run those are called the runway protection zones. And basically, those areas are defined by the FAA as being under the control of the airport owner, um, clear of, of objects which would be incompatible with airport years and basically enhance the protection of people and property on the ground. Depending on the type of airport and the type of approaches that are, that are at your airport, those runway protection zones um, would differ in size. What's shown here is about the smallest <coughs> RPZs that, that, that the FAA recognizes. And this would serve small aircraft or aircraft which weigh less than 12,500 pounds and serve visual approaches only. Um, as you can see, there are homes, there's development, there's incompatible land uses within the runway protection zones. Your other constraint is runway length. Right now, your runway is a little under 2,700 feet in length. Um, the FAA standard for small aircraft or aircraft which weigh less than 12,500 pounds is 4,300 feet in length. And a regional airport minimal length there would be to 5,000 feet in length. Some of the other constraints at your airport which prevent it from becoming a regional airport are runway taxiway separation, um, runway safety areas, or that's the area around the runway environment. And the, and, and the ability to accommodate other than small.